Just ahead on American Black Journal, the Urban League celebrates a milestone anniversary. I'm going to talk with President N. Charles Anderson about the organization's efforts to change lives in the African American community. Plus, we'll meet a woman who broke gender barriers in the U.S. Army. Stay right there. American Black Journal starts now. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. The Urban League of Detroit and Southeastern Michigan is celebrating 100 years of helping African Americans and other people of color live better lives. As an affiliate of the National Urban League, the organization serves more than 70,000 people each year through its programs and services. The league focuses on a variety of community needs, including education and youth empowerment, economic self-sufficiency, health and quality of life, civic engagement and leadership, and civil rights and racial justice. Joining me now is the president and CEO of the Urban League, and Charles Anderson. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you, Stephen. It's great to be here. Uh, that is quite a milestone, 100 years. 100 years, years. That's, right. that's a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think back and read the history of the Urban League, there was a lot going on 100 years ago sure. as African Americans were transitioning from the South and moving to the North. And an organization like the Urban League to providing social work or social services was much, very much needed as uh, people came to this community. Yeah, and that's really the focus of the Urban League yeah. is that mm -hmm. social service component. Right. I think a lot of people sometimes get the Urban League and the NAACP yeah. Yeah. sort of confused. Yeah. What's what's the, the yeah. difference between the right. two? That yeah. social yeah. services component yeah. really is the answer. Yeah, well, you know, interestingly, I was a <coughs> national staff member. I worked for the NAACP. Uh -huh. I used to be on the national staff of the NAACP before joining the Urban League. And there are two very different organizations. The, uh, they're very complementary organizations in a sense that they work well together, but the Urban League uh, is a direct service organization and the NAACP is primarily a, an advocacy organization. So uh, they get out and beat the bushes and strive to get companies to change their ways, but the Urban League has that uh, staff and those direct services that try to react to the needs. Uh, of the community. Yeah. How have those needs changed over a century of time? You, you, you point yeah. out that blacks were coming to Detroit a mm -hmm. hundred years ago mm -hmm. from the south and had right. really desperate needs that weren't being met mm -hmm. by government and other right. exactly. uh, organizations. It's a little different now, yeah. right? Well, you know, in, in one sense, the way you approach the, the, the uh, issues of the problem uh, would be a little different. But you know, way back in the uh, early years, the uh, workforce uh, that we call workforce development today, it may have been called vocational services and sure. employment services, but still there were efforts to provide employment services and getting people into work. Or in the 20s, the Urban League had a baby clinic working with mothers and their children, their little children. And today we have the Women, Infants, and Children program, the WIC program. Yeah. So, so in many respects, the Urban League had the Pen and Pallet Club way back in the day, uh, working with young people on academic excellence and getting them ready to, to, for careers. And today we still do education, youth development. We operate the college club. So the, the, uh, the, the general gist of those programs are pretty much the same. Youth development, education, employment services, health and welfare. Those are the common names and the common things that we still currently yeah. do. And, and the need for those services, yes. especially here yes. in Detroit, is only getting yeah. Well, unfortunately, larger, right? it's not getting as better and much better as we would like for it to be. Yeah. Uh, I think the, as the population grows, more and more people are are uh, coming in there. Some are prepared, but we still have many challenges when it comes to youth uh, education and development. Uh, you're trying to help young people uh, go or break into the skilled trades, for example, and they're still not reading at the eighth grade level and doing math at the eighth grade level, even though they are far removed from high school. Yeah. So you still have these challenges of getting individuals ready ready for the workforce and uh, getting them acclimated to, uh, to moving upward 
and forward. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a big part of your annual celebration, of course, is the Distinguished yes. Warriors. Yes. Uh, I always want to yeah. figure out, what, yeah. what does it take to get a Distinguished well, well, Warrior well, Award? You know, case, case, Steve, you got to live a little longer. <laughs> you know? older, yeah. right? Uh, you are distinguished, but you have to live a little longer. In, in, our, in our way of deciding Distinguished Warriors, we look at people who are, fit, who are 65 years of age and over. This is about a yeah, lifetime, a lifetime of Who have given immeasurably in the areas of human and civil rights. And then we recognize those individuals at what we call a Distinguished Warriors Award, uh, uh, honors. Now, I mean, a posthumous honoree, we do usually have at least one posthumous. That person may not have been uh, 65 at the time of death, but we still would honor that person for the contributions that they made. So, so you know, this year we honored uh, Roy Levy Williams, and Roy was a, uh, an Urban League. He was a president of the Urban League at one point, uh, and a community organizer at the Urban League before he left to be the... Um, um, head of the Urban Affairs Office for Governor Milligan and ultimately the Urban League and then at the Chrysler Corporation. George P. Barnes, who uh, the first African American to optician. own the optician. Guest on the show just yes. a few weeks ago. Uh, an outstanding contribution, unsung in many ways, yeah. and so we're glad to honor him. Uh, Dan Crickbaum, who passed last year, a chief of staff to Governor Granholm, but worked in this community for many years in many ways. Uh, then when there was Captain uh, Mildred Leonard, who uh, the first female African American to run the wax in the United States Army, but some people know her as Big Sean's uh, <laughs> grandmother. grandmother right. Yeah, yeah right. and of course the uh, in, you know the uh, John Conyers, the 52-year <laughs> congressman, uh, the dean of the Congress. We honored uh, Congressman Conyers as one of our honorees this year as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, when you look sort of uh, for uh, two questions about Urban League mm -hmm. uh, funding, yeah. uh, that's a challenge for yeah. all nonprofits right yeah. now, trying yeah. to especially those delivering social services, mm -hmm. but also direction. What are the things that you feel like uh, Urban League may need to pivot toward or mm -hmm. do? Yeah. That it's well, not you know, we would love to see, you know, how we work to get more people involved and connected to the Urban League, but we want to make sure that we're working uh, to deal with the issues that people in our community are, are having. We want to take a holistic approach, a holistic approach to those services. Yeah. So when young people come through, we want to deal with all of the issues that they have in the preparation, uh, you know, making sure that you're working with them on their um, um, academic preparation as well as college preparation. We want to do more work in the area of uh, health uh, around um, substance abuse and AIDS education and information yeah. because that's a big issue particularly among the older women in the African American community sure. the the, uh, the incidences of growth of AIDS that's something that we need to deal with but we want to we want to kind of focus on that but also work harder at making sure young people in particular are prepared for the jobs of the future. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was sharing with someone the other day that there used to be a menial job that sitting in the, uh, at the booth at the parking lot, <laughs> you know, helping people pay yeah. and lead the parking lot. Well, that's self-service now. Yeah. Uh, those kind of jobs don't exist, and we need to be working more diligently in our society and our communities to make sure we are making people aware and getting them acclimated and prepared for the different kinds of careers going forward. Yeah, and and support for the yes. Urban League. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How are you able to maintain that? In well, you know, uh, you know, we <laughs> we uh, refine our skills at begging. You know, in terms, <laughs> but but you know, we work hard. The dinner is a way to uh, generate money. We work hard at trying to to uh, make ourselves better known to the community and how important their membership dollars are to us. If we could get you know a thousand people to join the Urban League at fifty. Uh, dollars per person, that would make a significant impact on our budget and our ability to fund some of our youth development activities that right. we currently have. Right. So uh, getting, helping educate and inform the community about what we do and hoping that they will uh, maybe some of their moving dollars one one month will go right. toward go to this uh, paying for the Urban League and collectively that would make a tremendous difference in, in how we fundraise and what we're able to do. Yeah, uh, in the open I mentioned there that uh, 70,000 people yeah. a year, but but uh, on a daily basis you are meeting an incredible yeah. uh, well, amount of well, need. Well, you know, you know sometimes when people say what the Urban League isn't doing anything, I always point out there are about 14,000 people a month. Yeah who think differently right. because who we need are, the, who need the services. They, 
if they've come to one of our seven or eight WIC clinics, we have WIC office hours that are late at seven o'clock Mondays and Wednesdays, two Saturdays a month. We're trying to make sure the services are available so that the working poor doesn't have to take off work to take advantage of our services. Yeah. Our college club meets on Sundays. We have 55 year old plus senior citizens that we pay to do 20 hours a week in a nonprofit organization as they develop their work skills. And that's a one and a half million dollar a year uh, payroll just yeah. for that group of individuals. The WIC uh, benefits that we put into the economy in Detroit is worth, worth about $10 million annually. Right. So, you know, we're making a, a tremendous difference in the lives of a lot of people. The problem is sometimes that what we do is so, not so sexy, yeah, so it's right. not always it's, in the media, not grabbing not, headlines. Grabbing headlines and yeah. things of that nature. All right, well, congratulations Thank on you. 100 years. Thank you, keep it up. appreciate that, thank yeah. you. All right, coming up next on American Black Journal, we're going to meet a woman who made history in the U.S. Army. Plus, we'll have the story of an American graduate champion. But first, here's a look at some important moments in Detroit's black history. I'm Ken Coleman with a look back at African American life in Detroit. This week in 1864, the first Michigan colored regiment left for Civil War service to fight on the Union side. In 1941, blacks alongside whites took part in a UAW strike at Ford Motor Company over work conditions. And in 1984, music legend Marvin Gaye was killed during a domestic dispute with his father. These are significant events this week in Detroit's black history, taken from the book On This Day, African American Life in Detroit. So we close out Women's History Month. It's my pleasure to welcome a woman who's made history several times in the United States Army. Her most recent achievement was being named the first female commander of the TACOM Life Cycle Management Center at the Detroit Arsenal. Uh, her nomination for the post was approved by President Obama and by Congress. I'm pleased to welcome Major General Gwendolyn Bingham to American Black Journal. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's my pleasure to be here, Stephen. Thank you. So explain first what this uh, what this new post means. I'm not sure people well, even know what TACOM is. Well, thank you so much <laughs> for that. TACOM is Tank Automotive and Armaments Life up Cycle Management County, Command, right? Macomb County, yeah. just up the road. And uh, we are your Army's uh, only active duty component uh, organization that's here. We are headquartered there, and we have there in that our headquarters about 7,500 men and women between military and civilians. Yeah. If you look at us as a life cycle management command, we have about 19,000 men and women who make up our life cycle management command in about 100 different locations yeah. around the world. So very pleased to be a great uh, partner. And in the our first community. female to, to command that uh, I am. station. A very important yeah. part of. Macomb County's economy, too. I know uh, that having that there is a big deal to us here uh, in well, Michigan. Well, we uh, just this last year, we awarded about $6.3 billion. Right. Uh, one and a half billion of those were awarded right here in the state of Michigan. Yeah. And so we are uh, very proud every day to be a good partner and teammate and, and also to be able to contribute to the economy yeah. of Michigan. Uh, as I said in the intro there, uh, this is one in a number of firsts uh, that you have experienced as part of the Army. Talk about some of those. All right. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I'm just humbled. <laughs> I, I, my roots begin in Troy, Alabama. I was the daughter of a, a military man and his bride of almost 56 years. and. Um, I've been able to uh, be in the Army now just over 34 and a half years, but when I started out, I really came in for four years and not a day longer. Now you want to do and your so term and my thought was out. I was on an Army ROTC <laughs> four-year scholarship yeah. and said, okay, I'll give it a whirl. And uh, as it was, I literally fell in love, not only with the man I married, met and married almost 33 <laughs> years ago, uh, but I fell in love with this vocation called the U.S. Army, and it's been uh, wonderful ever since. It's and been a great journey. What is it about uh, the Army or being in the Army that's, uh, that's got you so... Uh, I'm, that's a great question. Yeah. I, uh, I consider myself a people person, and so for all of those assignments that I've had the privilege to be uh, uh, a, a member of a team of, I, it is a people that I resonate with the most. And so 
when we talk about the magnanimous missions that our Army does and our military around the globe, that can't happen without people. Yeah. And so I've enjoyed being able to team with others, to be able to build relationships, and to be able to partner to accomplish our missions. Yeah, uh, It is unusual these days uh, to see career Army uh, service people, correct? I mean, it's, it's not, it's not mm -hmm. as common no. as it usually, or is that no, not true? No, it's uh, my father. Yeah. Uh, well, my father right. was an Army uh, <laughs> yeah. NCO of over 20 years himself. Uh -huh. His twin brother was in the Army over 20 years. Uh, so not uncommon at all. Um, the numbers are small if you look at us as a nation, uh -huh. the number that uh -huh. ser have served in the military. Um, but I think many, we are an all-volunteer force, sure. and that's a good news story. So the men and women who raise their right hand and swear that oath of allegiance, yeah. they come in knowing that uh, they may be put in harm's way, but they're willing to do that. And many times we have folks that make the Army a career. After all, that's what happened to me. Right. Um, and talk about that point where you, f where you figured... Uh, this is what I want to do the rest of, um, of, of my <laughs> career. As you said, it was initially right. a four-year stint. Right. What, at what point did you say, I'm, I'm just going to stay forever? Well, that's a great question. So when I met Merritt, my husband, he too was a lieutenant. He was an air defender. And so we stayed uh, kind of dual um, ranked together, lieutenant and captain, for first ten and a half years or so. And he decided to get out and go into education. And I was just having literally so much fun. I said, well... You know, one of us needs to stay in and make a, you know, a, a, a career out of it, uh -huh. and so it became me. And uh, at 20 year mark, I thought, okay, you could retire, but I was still having so much fun and learning my craft, uh, meeting so many uh, great teammates and learning so much about what the Army does, both at the tactical level and throughout the strategic level. And so uh, I'm no kidding. It has just been a remarkable journey, and all of the people who I've had the privilege uh, to team with have made it so. Yeah. Uh, you, you said that you started in ROTC. Uh, Correct. Uh, was that in college or? In high school. In high school. Actually, I was three years in high school and then on the four-year Army ROTC yeah. in college. And, and what do you say to young people uh, about that opportunity uh, as young as high school? It's a great uh, question and uh, ROTC Reserve Officer Training Course gives you such a fundamental basis or foundation for learning leadership. Mm -hmm. You learn leadership, working uh, teamwork with other uh, cadets and uh, you're exposed to a number of broadening opportunities even within um, high school. And so if you kick that up a notch and you uh, look at it from a college perspective, one of the great beauties about ROTC and one of the things that uh, sold me on it was I was looking for a way to pay for my college yeah. education <laughs> so I could be not so close to home. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, the Reserve Officer Training Corps Scholarship was a way to do that and I was blessed to be able to uh, receive that. But any other student can apply for that yeah. uh, without obligation. You can take leadership courses in ROTC uh -huh. for a couple of years before you must uh, obligate yourself at the third year mark. Yeah, yeah. So I would tell anyone to really consider it, but my one advice to all of our young people is to never say never. Right. Because you just might fool yourself and stay in as long as I have. Right. And, and it really is a sort of world of possibility. World of possibilities, uh, being, uh, correct. The military. Um, uh, talk about the posts that you've had uh, that you that you liked the most or that you remember the most uh, over your career? You know, people have asked me, what's your favorite <laughs> tour? And every time I go to one place, I said, boy, that was my best tour. And then I go to another one <laughs> and, and say, boy, school. that was even better than the last one. You know, uh, they all have been special to me. I take a little bit of all of where I've been because that has helped shape and mold my thinking and whom I am as a person. And, uh, you know, when I leave this post eventually here, I will take a little bit of Detroit with me yeah. uh, because you learn so many things. Uh, this post uh, being a, the confluence of acquisition, logistics, and technology at TACOM, um, I've just learned so much about the depth and breadth uh, dealing with our partnering entities, academia, uh, industry, and uh, it's just our supply chain managers, it's been yeah. phenomenal. I mean, it really is integrated into so it many is. different parts it of, is. of the state. It, it really is. And a lot of people don't know about yeah, uh, know. even TACOM. Yeah. Uh, we're a subordinate headquarters of the Army Materiel Command. My boss is uh, four-star general, General Dennis Vi. 
and uh, we basically were stood up here 75 years ago. So Steve and I will tell you I'm excited because this is our 75th year and, and as we say in the Army we're still rolling along right. and uh, doing some magnanimous work for our nation and it's our privilege to do so. Yeah. Uh, have, have any of your assignments been in uh, conflict zones and how was that different from the great, other ones? Great question. Um, I was assigned with the 1st Theater Sustainment Command at Fort Bragg uh, in 2010 uh -huh. and deployed over to uh, Kuwait and uh, a few months into Afghanistan mm -hmm. during Operation I Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. And I can just tell you, having been there during that tour and been back over there, uh, our men and women uh, are in harm's way. They do a phenomenal job yeah. for our nation. And I'm so pleased to be able to thank them publicly and every chance I get for the world they do in a multi, uh, multi-functional capabilities and in, in oper occupations. Yeah. So um, it's humbling. Yeah. And so. Uh, I mean, I think it's one thing uh, you want to make clear to to people is that's not the the full breadth of military service is, is mm -hmm. that sort of duty. I mean, you've done a lot of different things. Cor correct. And. Um, I, I think that's also uh, goes in line with us being an all volunteer force. Sure. Uh, I had the good privilege last year to act actually administer the oath of enlistment to high school students that were going in all of the services there. And um, it's uh, they raised their right hand and swear that oath full in full knowledge that they could be deployed in harm's way. But there are all other locations around the globe in Europe, uh, Korea, the Pacific, and in the continental United States. Sure. And uh, just being able to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves and ourselves as individuals is very gratifying and fulfilling. Yeah. And so we do that uh, in full measure uh, and very proud to be a part of our nation's missions. All right. So quickly, we've got about 30 seconds left. What do you think your next assignment might be? Well, <laughs> there's rumors out there. I, I can tell you I'm sending my household goods to D.C. Yeah, okay. I don't know what okay. my next job will be exactly, <laughs> but I can just assure myself and you that uh, if it's been as good as it's been for 34 and a half yeah. years, I'm going to love it. Okay. And so no reason for me not to, look at, uh, to be excited yeah. about it. Okay, General Bingham, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Finally today, we have the story of a man who's making a tremendous difference in the lives of young people in Detroit. Chris Kyles is the director of a West Side Boys and Girls Club, and his passion is helping students achieve their educational goals. Detroit Public Television highlighted Chris as an American graduate champion. He's my boss, but he's also my friend. Um, we're really cool. He's actually, he's one of my best friends. Um, he is the type of person that you really, really, really enjoy working with. The reason I do this uh, is because I wanted um, to come back and help my community and let them know that you can beat the odds, you can go to college, uh, you can become successful. And it makes me smile to see uh, and feel good to see these young men exploring different avenues. He's funny, uh, he's caring. Uh, he's dedicated to his work and his family. I mean, if you if you follow him, if you know him, he, he'll steer you down the right path. If he sees you're you're off course, so that's the good part about him. He's, he's really a good guy. You can't be strict all the time. You have to be able to let your hair down. But the fun helps you build the relationship. That's the important part: building the relationship. And you build the relationship, and then the fun. And you add the fun then everything else falls into place. And the Boys and Girls Club is a fun, safe place. And that's why a lot of youth come. Chris is the type of individual that he's hands-on with kids, even motivating kids. Some kids are just like, I want to play basketball. And if you, don't, if you can't play you know, professionally, what else are you going to do? Like, you have to have a backup plan. You know, Every child has the dream to play in the NBA, the NFL, but what, you need something concrete. And he's the type of person that will sit down and develop what that child has a passion in and build upon that. He always stresses the importance of education, um, especially for people who play sports, because that kind of gets lost on them. They believe that all you have to do is be good at this sport, and then that's it. But you have to be good at school too, and you have to take that just as seriously as you take sports. I just like that the people I play with, they're really competitive. When we play, it's like you can have fun and be competitive at the same time. I do want to keep uh, pursuing my dream, play basketball in college, but um, I always want to do journalism. 
education is key. Education is key, and once you get that college degree, um, it's something no one can ever take away from you. Um, it puts you in arenas and it puts you in positions that can help you become successful in life, reach your goals, um, but I believe education is the most important thing in life. The Boys and Girls Club has like many different partnerships with different things, like D2D Diploma to Degrees helped me along the way with like um, interviews, speeches, um, writing portfolios, resumes. Chris is the type of person that gives 150%. Um, he is the one that has motivated me to give my life to this whole cause, the Boys and Girls Club. Um, he is there sun up to sun down. Uh, we are within the full time 40 hours. He goes way above and beyond that. Chris is the person that has dedicated his life to making sure each child, each and every child, is not good enough for it to just be 10 out of 100. Each and every child should make sure that they reach their full potential. Uh, my favorite part is working with the youth, um, seeing them reach their dreams, their goals, their aspirations, seeing them grow. Um, it's kind of the payoff now because I've been working uh, with the club for 16 going on 17 years, so I'm starting to see kids graduate, have families, things of that nature, so that, that's the payoff, seeing them be successful in life. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, you can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. Plus, you can hear our program on WDET 1019 FM. We'll see you next time. This program is part of American Graduate. Let's make it happen. A public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal.